All right, the, the after lunch slot is hands down the hardest, okay? Because you've already had, and if you've been in the DNA track, you've already had a morning like this, right? Am I right? Have you been sitting in the DNA track? It's been so interesting and fascinating, but kind of like whoo, way up here somewhere, right? Yeah. So, uh, and now you've just had a fantastic meal. I can't even believe the food at this hotel. That is so amazing. So, uh, yeah, so I just want to let you know in advance that when I was in college, I took an organic chemistry class, and it was one of those huge lecture halls. There were like 400 students in the class. I don't know how he did it, but my professor knew everyone's name. If he saw you in the hallway, hey, Diane, and you're like, how do you know me? I'm one of like 400 faces. I really don't know how he did it, but it meant that you could not sleep in his class. <laughs> because he knew your name and he would call you out by name until you woke up. Now, this never happened to me because I was way too nervous to fall asleep in class. Like, he's going to know. Uh, but lots of other people did, mostly boys, <laughs> fell asleep in class. Um, so I don't know all of your names, but you have a name tag on, which means I'm just going to ask the person next to you and we'll just, just talk, start talking to you until you wake up. So just FYI. That might happen in case you decide to take a little afternoon nap here. Um, if you were in my, how many of you were not in my class yesterday? Okay, okay, that's good because yesterday was like pure fun and um, highlighting all the great tools at my heritage, and it was kind of light and I feel like really easy to understand. Not that this won't be easy to understand, but this is, this can be a little bit more thinking. I, I think today is just more of a thinking day. So um, you put your thinking cap on and it will be fun, but this is, this is going to be methodology. How do you go from a list of DNA cousins into an ancestral discovery? That's what we're all about, right? That's what we want to happen. So what's the methodology that makes that possible? So that's what we're talking about today. So it starts, thankfully, with you. Because you are 100% you. Earth shattering, almost, right? But this is, again, one of those biology principles that maybe you thought you didn't really know that much, but you really do. And the amazing thing about DNA as a record type is that you are the only one of you. You're the only one of you who has ever lived and who will ever live as far as your DNA is concerned. Though I did talk to a lady earlier who has lived past lives. So if you are in that category, then it's your DNA though. Her DNA has only lived this life. So no matter what your belief is about that, like that's a biological fact. So that means that you have to be tested. Because if you're not tested, your personal genetic record is lost. There will never be another one like you. Now, I know there's somebody who's a smart aleck thinking, except for your identical twin. Is there, you guys are thinking that. I know there's, there's some. It's the guy in the back. My military. You're thinking that. Yeah. Oh, it was him. All right. Oh, he has a twin. Oh, well, then, of course, you were thinking that. <laughs> oh, you have twins yourself. Yeah. <laughs> yes. So, but for most of us, you're it. Now, you always test the oldest generation first. For family history purposes, they are more important than you. It's just the way it is. Their DNA is more valuable than yours. But for record purposes... Each of us has the same value. We all have 100% of our own DNA, which means we each have our own record, which means we each need a DNA test, really, to just document and represent our own record. So because of this principle, that means that your DNA cannot fully represent any of your ancestors. So you only have your parents who are the closest people to you genetically, maybe not emotionally, but genetically the closest people to you, you have half of their DNA. Half. Now, I'm more of a glass half full kind of girl than a glass half empty kind of girl, but really, either way you look at it, you're missing half, right? So if you want to know about your ancestors, 
you need more than just you. You are not enough. I know, is that damaging you psychologically? You're not enough, okay? You're not. Genetically, you're not enough. You cannot tell the story of your family by yourself. That means our most important goal with our DNA match list is to gather groups of people, the right groups of people together to help us better represent our ancestors. So we call that, or I call that grouping idea, a genetic network. You're creating a genetic network of people, the goal of which is to identify and document and tell the story of your common ancestor. So at the core of every genetic network is a question. Because I know most people, when you get your DNA test results back, you go to that match page and you just kind of scroll through it and maybe you click randomly on a couple of people and then you're like, I don't, I don't know what to do. And maybe you go watch Netflix, okay? so. We wanna minimize that, okay? So that means that you have to walk in with a question. This is a record set. Would you walk into an archive or a library doing your family history without an idea of what you wanted to know? Would you just walk in and start pulling books off the shelves and looking through them? No, that would be insane. It's the same way with your DNA test result list. This is a record type. You need to ask it a question. So the two questions or the two ways you can look at your DNA match list are one, who is my ancestor? I wanna find out about a particular person on my family tree. I can ask that question to my DNA match list. Or I see a cousin on my DNA match list that I don't recognize and I wanna figure out who that is. So two questions. Let's talk about the methodology about how to answer these questions using your DNA match list. So we're gonna start with my question. So here's my question. This is my, who is my ancestor question. I want to know who are the parents of Lily Harvey? She's an ancestor in my family tree, which means if I want to know about her, I need to find the matches in my match list that have something to do with her. She's on my dad's side. So I don't need any of the matches that match my mom's side, right? I need the matches that match my dad's side. So we call the matches that have something to do with our question, our best matches. So how do we find best matches? Turns out best matches start with you. Or in my case, they start with my dad because my dad has been tested. Again, always the oldest generation. So really, when I am doing research with my DNA results, I never look at my own test, ever, because I've had both of my parents tested. So it does me absolutely no good, actually, to look at my own results when I've got my parents. So there's my dad. This is his genealogy back to his unknown ancestor. So there's his mom, and then her mom, and then her mom, back to this question. This is the person I want to know. You need to make sure that your ancestral question is within six generations. If it's not, our current technology in autosomal DNA has a really, really hard time helping you. So the first thing you need to do is make sure that your question is within range. When we count six, you start with the, the next generation, so my grandmother is one, two, three, four. So I'm looking to fill in the fourth generation. That's doable. So that's the first thing. You have to make sure autosomal DNA is even an option. If it's not, you'll have to turn to maybe Y DNA or mitochondrial DNA to help you answer your question. But as long as it's in range, we can use autosomal DNA to help us. Now remember, autosomal DNA is the kind you got from both of your parents, right? So. First of all, we figured out who was I to her, making sure you're in range with the ancestor in question. The next step is to find a best match. Remember, a best match has something to do with our question. So in our case, our best match is going to have something to do with Lily Harvey. 
So I can use information, genealogy information, like her surname, and this is her birth location, Kentucky. So a best match is going to have DNA in common with me, and they're going to have genealogy in common with me. Ideally, I need to find another descendant of the ancestor I'm researching. So if Lily's my ancestor, she's documented, I know she's my ancestor, I'm looking for her parents, I need to find another descendant of Lily to test. So how do you find that person? Well, hopefully they've already tested, right? And hopefully they've also included Lily Harvey in their pedigree chart they posted on MyHeritage. If they do that, the smart matching system at MyHeritage will find them. And you can see it right here. I can view smart matches. I can see that this person shares Lily Harvey with me. And you've done it. MyHeritage has done it for you. They've done it using the smart matching technology. So number one, check your smart matches. See if any of them are descendants of the ancestor you want to research. They become your smart match. So I can also click on the pedigree chart of the person and I can see that Lily Harvey is in their pedigree chart. And then I want to double check it, right? Because just because somebody threw Lily Harvey in their pedigree chart doesn't mean they're actually her descendant. So you need to make sure you're double checking. So let's look at how you double check a match based on their DNA. All right, now they showed up on your DNA match list. They have this girl in their chart. You think that's like closed book, done deal, but it's not because there's lots of reasons why you could match genetically and not share Lily Harvey. You could share some totally different ancestor. So you need to double check the system. So. We need to ask, which generation in my matches chart should I be looking for our common ancestor? So to evaluate a match based solely on genetics, your first goal is to figure out in their chart, when should you be looking for a common ancestor? This is actually a pretty big idea because when you open up someone's pedigree chart and you're looking for a common surname, or a common location and you don't see any and you think, oh, I'm not gonna figure that out. Most of the time it's because their chart doesn't go back far enough, right? They're posting a small chart on their, on their site and you need more generations, but how many more? So figuring out which generation in their chart you should find the connection can help you figure out how much work there is to do. So let's take a look at how this works. So if this is my match, this is my smart match, this is my individual who has Lily Harvey in their pedigree chart. So here's the match. It's through their mother's father's mother that we get Lily. And actually the match that I found was in the smart match because they actually didn't have Lily on their pedigree chart. This was a hint through the MyHeritage hinting system. Why? Because they have the surname Clanch. So I don't know what this whole Alberter thing is here because that's not right. <laughs> Floyd's parent is actually a Clanch, hence his surname is Clanch. Anyway, they, they, they use the surname of the wife where usually we do it the other way around, right? You copy the surname of the husband into the wife. They did it the other way. Again, People don't always do complete pedigrees. So it took just a tiny bit of work for me to see this connection, making this person a best match. This person is a descendant of Lily if this connection is correct. So the first step is to put yourself on their chart. Where does my dad fit on this chart? And the only tool we have to do that really is birthdays. Okay, now that doesn't always work because generations can be long or short, but it's a really good place to start. So looking at this chart, and I've privatized this information here, but looking at this chart, my dad was born in 1947, and you can see here the dad here was born in 1919, which is right about the time my dad's parents were born. So this is where my dad fits on this matches chart. Does that make sense? 
okay? So put yourself or the person who's tested onto the chart. That's the first step. So by doing that, you can see automatically that the match is once removed. Now, these are genealogy terms that get like all mixed up, right? This whole removed thing. Basically, it works like this. My dad is her, is this matches mom's right here, cousin, like even cousin. Anyone younger is removed. Okay, so think to yourself, do you have a first cousin in mind? Think of your own first cousin. Okay, does that first cousin have kids? The child is your first cousin once removed. Okay, that's how this removed thing works. Okay, we're gonna talk a little bit more about that. And in my um, next steps quick sheet that I have out on my table, I do talk a lot about how to do what we're just about to do here. So if you need a little refresher, you can come out and look at that. So here they are. So from here, we wanna figure out what kind of cousin should this person be if Lily is our connecting ancestor? What's our genealogical relationship? So the way you do that is you take yourself and you skip the next generation and then you start labeling first cousins and second cousins and so on. So you take their chart, you put yourself on the chart, then moving to the right from yourself, you skip and then start first, second, third, fourth, whatever cousins. Okay, that's the labeling part. Okay, how's your mind? Getting a little bendy? Okay. So by doing this, you can figure out your genealogical relationship to your match if this is your connecting ancestor. So if Lily really does connect us, then our relationship is second cousins once removed. Do you see how that works? So this is our genealogical relationship according to the pedigree chart. Now we can compare this relationship to our genetic relationship. What does DNA say? If DNA says we're siblings, there's a problem right? If DNA says we're fourth cousins, there's a problem. So we need to compare the genetic relationship with the genealogical relationship. So here's our genealogical relationship. And my heritage says this is our estimated genetic relationship. So does second cousin once removed fit in this range somewhere? Yeah. It definitely does. So that gives you confidence that this really is a best match. This person is a descendant of Lily Harvey, meaning we can use them to help us find out more about her. Now, if we want to take it even one more level, again, you don't have to do this, but if you're super sciencey, you want to try it. You can also look at the total amount of shared DNA. So we measure DNA in a unit called centimorgans. It's just a way to talk about how much DNA we're sharing. So we're sharing 113 centimorgans with Michael, our match. We can take that number into something called the Shared Centimorgan Project. This project was developed by Blaine Bettinger, another genetic genealogist in the United States, and he asked a bunch of people just like you, how much DNA are you sharing with your second cousin and your third cousin and your second cousin once removed? And he gathered all of this data and made this really, really nice table. The table then gives you the number of centimorgans that you should share with someone with this relationship. So we are sharing 113 centimorgans with someone we think should be our second cousin once removed. So you go to that spot on the table, second cousin once removed, and we see the average amount of shared DNA for second cousins once removed is 123 centimorgans. Does that fit with our 113? Yeah. So now you've really verified that genetically and genealogically, you guys are both 
descendants of Lily Harvey. If that wasn't enough for you, if you're extra sciencey, you can take that same number into a probability calculator. The probability calculator was developed by Leah Larkin, and it's on Johnny Pearl's DNA Painter website. So that was like a whole bunch of name dropping right there, okay? But in that, you can put that total amount of shared DNA that you have with a relative, and it gives you the likelihood that you have one of these relationships. What I like about the table is it puts a number on our estimate. I also like that it gives us all the possible relationships that could connect you. I also like that you can see it's only 42% likely. That's the most likely it can be. This reminds us this genetic stuff is not absolute. You will not find a second cousin once removed that's 100% likely to be that relationship. It doesn't happen. That's not how this works. Now, if you get up to closer relationships like parents and siblings and half-siblings, these percentages go way up. But as soon as you hit that second cousin, third cousin, fourth cousin, this is what you're going to see. It's all a game of probabilities and likelihoods. There are no absolutes. That's why we need genealogy with our genetics. Genetics alone cannot, cannot ever tell us a relationship. You have to have both to do this right. So this is kind of a more simplified chart I made just to kind of lay out in a linear fashion our relationship. So here's my dad. And here's Lily Harvey. So any other descendant of Lily Harvey is going to be some kind of second cousin to my dad. Second cousin once removed, true second cousin. Whereas descendants of my dad's grandparents, of course, are first cousins. So I just wanted to lay it out for you kind of in a line so that you could see how things line up based on relationships. So here we found them, finally, after all that. <laughs> Michael is our best match. Now we can use Michael and the DNA we share with Michael to find a new match. So a new match is someone who shares DNA with us and with our best match. This is how it works. It's just fishing. I don't really like fishing because I think it's boring. But fishing in your DNA database is not boring. It's very exciting, okay? Because basically what you're doing is you're baiting your hook with the shared DNA that you have with your cousin. And you're asking the database to help you find people that are sharing DNA with both of you. How do we do that? The shared matches tool. It's my favorite tool. So the shared matches tool lets us ask who in the database is sharing DNA with me and with Michael. If someone is sharing DNA with me and with Michael, it's very likely they're also related to Lily. Those are the people we want to find. So we use the shared matches tool to find new matches. And then we do it again. You use the shared matches tool on one of the new matches to find more new matches. And so on and so on and so on and so on. We just do it over and over and over again until you get a genetic network. This is how you find that group of people from the thousands in your match list. You are going to whittle down your list to maybe 20 maybe 10 individuals that you focus your research efforts on. Those people are your genetic network. So here's three tips for making a good genetic network or for identifying the pieces of a good genetic network. The first thing is to find family groups. So in your genetic network, individuals who are first cousins or closer 
to each other form one spot in your network. They don't get their own spots. They form one spot. They represent one genetic line. So you'll find this especially valuable because there are a lot of very enthusiastic genealogists out there who have tested all 10 of their siblings, okay? And that can very quickly overwhelm your network. So you take all 10 siblings, they become one spot in your network. Does that make sense? So you're gathering related people together so that you can better determine their relationship. Now you can do this in a couple of ways. My Heritage has this section in the match page where you can see who is managing this DNA kit. So the person who asked all nine of their siblings to be tested could easily be managing all nine of them and you will see their username in this section. So you'll be able to tell, oh, all of these people are managed by this one person. They're probably all related to each other. Let's gather them together into one spot on our network. You can also evaluate your genetic cousins. So let's talk a little bit more about how that works based on this table. So that's what I was talking about before. You take that total amount of shared DNA and you take it into the shared centimorgan project to verify that that's your relationship. So let's talk about these boxes. This top section is your relationship. That middle number is the average amount of shared DNA. And the bottom number is the range. So I think it's really informative to look at these ranges. So this is a second cousin. You can share as little as 46 centimorgans and as many as 515. So again, science is random inheritance, which means you can have a lot of shared DNA or a little bit, but this is the amount we see most often. Now, if you really, really like this stuff, there are these fancy histograms that you can look up for the project. And you can actually see for yourself where these averages are filing out to be. I like to use these histograms when I see a cousin that seems like an outlier, right? They're within the range, but they're pretty close to the edge of the range. So I like to come out here and see these kinds of numbers that if I'm in this range where there's only six other people ever who have reported this particular genetic relationship, it makes me a little worried. But if I'm on the edge and there's you know 73 people, that's not as bad, right? So understanding how the distribution of the data works can sometimes influence you to decide, you know what, I need to look at this again, or nah, it's probably okay. So you can use the genetic tools to help you better understand the relationships of people in your network. You should also understand your limitations, which really boil down to this. Just because you have gathered a bunch of people together who all share DNA, that does not mean they share a common ancestor. It doesn't. So you've used the shared matches tool, you've gathered all these people together, they all seem to be sharing DNA with each other, and you assume that that means you all share one common ancestor. It doesn't have to be that way, especially if you live in a small community or you come from a population that has a history of intermarriage. This isn't, this isn't gonna work all the time. So be careful and understand that while this usually works, you still have to, guess what? Do genealogy. That's what it comes down to. You can gather genetically a group of people together, but you won't actually know they're related to each other until you find the documentation. You just won't. So this is how you create your own genetic network. You make sure your question is within range. You find a best match, somebody else who's also related to the person you're asking about. You find a new match using the shared matches tool. And then you do that again and again and again. Okay? Does that sound like fun? Are you gonna go home and try it? Okay, because if you don't, you're gonna forget. Okay, so like tonight, you have to try this. Okay. But what you really end up with is a big list. It's just a big list of people. 
Now, again, in my resources at my table, I have an organizing your DNA matches little quick sheet that I kind of try to teach you my methodology for how I keep these people organized. But really, you just need a system. Whether you're writing it down on paper or keeping it in Excel or whatever you're doing, you're going to have lists of people. So you need a way to make sure you're organizing these lists of people so that you can see the patterns that we're going to talk about. So when I do that, when I'm looking for people who are related to Lily, of course, I'm also going to find people related to her husband, right? Because I really can't tell which DNA came from her and which came from her husband when I'm looking at her descendants. So keep that in mind. Even though you're researching one ancestor, that spouse's DNA is just going to mess things up. Spouses. All right. So how do you determine which of these matches are related to Lily and which of these are related to her husband, Mr. Butterfield? It's just do genealogy. You just do genealogy. A lot of times it's really obvious because the match you gather will have Butterfield's surname. And I'm like, spouse. And they get crossed off the list, right? So understanding that there's also spouse DNA in there means you have to filter it and look for just the people that are going to be related to Lily. So when I do that, I find a certain number of best matches. Those are the ones that I focus on. Those are the ones that I start to do research with. And those are the ones that I have to decide how are they related to each other? Because I don't know who I'm looking for, right? So if I find people that are all sharing a genetic connection to Lily, I don't know her mom's surname. Her dad's surname was probably Harvey, but if I'm looking for her mom, I have no idea what surname I'm looking for. So I need to find patterns in the DNA matches. I need to look through their pedigree charts and look for a surname that's common among all of them. I figure out how they're related to each other, then I can figure out how I'm related to them. So this all comes down to this idea we were talking about earlier, figuring out the right generation in someone's pedigree chart when you're related. Because now I have a big list of people, but when in their genealogy am I looking for our common ancestor? So let's go through a couple examples. So here's a DNA match, okay? Uh, if she's my second cousin, we are going to share one of four couples in common, right? That makes it a multiple choice question. Which of these four ancestral couples is our connecting couple? One of these four couples could hold the missing surname, the one that I don't know. So what I do is I write down these surnames, Walsh, Wills, Rasmussen, Peterson, Stewart, Har oh, Harvey, Wilson, and Curtis. Sorry, she shouldn't have been a Harvey. I made this example up. Shouldn't see a surname that you recognize if you're looking at people that you don't know. I'm looking then for individuals in my little genetic network who have one of these surnames. If I see that everybody has the Walsh surname, this becomes my focus, this couple, as opposed to one of the other ones. You can also look by location. If I know that Lily's in Kentucky, this guy's in Illinois, which is somewhat nearby, but these people are in Denmark. Probably not that close. So you can cross some places off of your list. So it's really, really, really important to try to figure out which generation in your matches chart holds your common ancestor. Then you have multiple choice. And it's better than trying to sift through the entire chart yourself. Now, what if the match that I connect with is 85? Okay, my dad was born 1947, okay? He's 70, 71, okay? If the match is older than him, now this is only 14 years older, so does that constitute a whole generation or not? Again, it's hard. But if this person is an entire generation older than my dad, then I'm no longer looking at the greats. I'm looking at the grandparent generation. 
Now I've gone from a multiple choice question, one of four ancestor couples to one of two ancestral couples. That's a big difference. Similarly, if the match is much younger than my dad in their 30s, instead of looking at the four great grandparents, I now have to look at the eight two times great grandparents. And you can see in this pedigree chart, this person is missing two of those eight couples. So if I don't see anything familiar in these other six couples, I might want to do just a little bit of their genealogy to see if I can fill in those other two couples as they might be our connection. So by just identifying which generation in this matches chart holds our ancestor, I know that if I do a little bit of their genealogy, I can fill in those extra two couples and maybe find our connection. That might be worth it for me. But if they're missing all eight, that's a big job. Is it worth it? If this is your only match and you're certain they're connected on that Lily Harvey line and you're certain the answer to your question is in their chart, wouldn't it be worth it for you to spend some time filling out their chart? It absolutely would. You're brick walled on your own line. You might as well do somebody else's genealogy for a while and you know how much you need to do. So understanding the right generation can be really, really helpful. You can also use, of course, the shared centimorgan project. You can use the shared centimorgan project to help you decide if someone is removed or not, to help you decide what kinds of relationships make the most sense statistically, and you start with those relationships. So it's a combination of using the genetics and using the genealogy to help you figure out your situation. But in the end, did I mention this? You always have to do genealogy. This is always where it comes back to. It's all about the genetics give you hints. They give you clues as to who your family could be, but only the records can connect you to your family with certainty. So when I do all of that, I get these couples. By looking at other people's family history, using my genetic networks, using the shared matches tool, I get William Harvey marries Elizabeth Cook and Norris Harvey marries Nancy Baker. These are two ancestral couples that could potentially fit, not here, but back one generation. That this ancestor is a child of one of these two couples. So what do I have to do to figure out which couple? Just say it, do, do genealogy, right? And so that's where I'm at, and because I, do other people's genealogy a lot more often than I do mine. I'm still here. <laughs> but this is how it works most often. This takes a long time. It takes a lot of work. It takes a lot of genealogy. But before I had nothing, nothing, no leads. And now I have this, which is a lot of information. Because now it really is just a genealogy question. I can now ask the records to show me who my ancestor is. So that's how you use a genetic network to investigate an ancestor. Now, what if you, oh, go ahead, yes. Right, so she's saying if you wanna do this, you've gotta find matches that have trees, and that is so true. Now, there are ways you can find trees for people who haven't posted trees. And I have on the back of my next steps quick sheet at my table, I have a whole little section on how to do that. Uh, it doesn't always work, but it can work. And so there, there are some ways that you can find trees for people that don't have trees. But you're right, this doesn't work unless you can see the genealogy of the person who's tested. So there's also a lot of um, tips on what I call sweet talking, right? So when you're reaching out to a new match, you have to think of it like a first date, right? Because, and maybe it's been a while. I mean, I've been married almost 20 years, so it's been a while since I've been on a first date, okay? Maybe it's been a while for you all too. But if you'll recall, 
A first date is all about deciding if you want a second date, right? So when you're writing to someone and you're asking them for information, you need to be dateable, okay? So it means on a first date, you don't spend a lot of time talking about yourself, right? It's always about asking them how they're doing and about their family, right? So don't pontificate about all the things you know about your family, okay? Keep it short and simple. And most of all, leave an open invitation. You know, at the end of the date, you're like, so you have my number, right? Just let them know you're available and how to contact you. That's what it's all about. At the end of every correspondence you write to a match, you should always say, hey, even if you have no idea how to do any of this stuff, even if you're not into family history, just write me back. Just let me know you got this. You'd be surprised how many people will write back. Because when they get your note and they don't know, they're afraid to say they don't know, or they're thinking, well, maybe I could find out, or, and then they forget. Give them something they can do that second when they read your correspondence. And that's just write back. And you'll be surprised at how many people do actually write back. All right, that's all about dating. Not going to give you any more dating advice. So next, what if you just want to find out about a cousin? What if you want to find out who this person on your match list is that you haven't seen before and you can't place? So this happened with uh, my grandmother. So my grandmother has passed away, but I have transferred her results into my heritage since she passed away before my heritage started offering DNA test results. And for the most part, most of her matches have all been really distant until last week when I was looking for a good case study to show to all of you, and I found this match, Sarah. So what I, I like a lot of things about the MyHeritage match page, but one of the things I really like is this section right here. Because immediately, without looking at anything, I know one, how old she is, and I know two, where she was born or where she was from. This was really, really, really exciting. Why? Because my grandmother's mother was born in Italy. She was an Italian immigrant to the United States. And so immediately, without looking at anything else, I know that this person is related on my grandmother's maternal side. What do I also know? Well, my grandmother's passed away, and she passed away when she was 100. So this girl is very, very young compared to my grandmother. So even though this is her relationship prediction, first cousin twice removed to third cousin once removed, she's much more likely to be in this twice removed category than she is to be a third cousin of some kind, right? So let's take a look at this match. So here's my grandmother, and you can see her father up here, James Arthur Reese, a good solid Welsh name, okay? And then here's Dominica Franza, her mother, who was born in Italy. And here's Martin and Ermina Gilda, both born in Italy. Not just in Italy, I must tell you, in Traversella, Italy, because my grandmother was exceptionally proud of her Italian heritage. Now, she loved her father and was glad she was Welsh, but man, she loved being Italian. And I think it was because her grandmother, Ermina Gilda here, who she was named after, she moved to the United States with her daughter and lived just down the street from them in Washington. And my grandma spent her entire childhood at her grandmother's house. And so she was totally 100% immersed in Italian culture. Plus, her mother was raising her. And in fact, her father, when she was five years old, the only argument she remembers between her parents was him insisting that they start speaking English to her because she only spoke Italian until she was five. And he said, she's going to school. She must speak English. She could understand it. She could even speak it, but she didn't because she was Italian. Okay. So there's her Italian heritage. And you can see it perfectly represented in her ethnicity results at MyHeritage. You can see here 49% Southern Europe, and here's her dad, 50% in that um, Northern Europe. It is pretty amazing, actually, this perfect split of my grandmother's ethnicity. And we can see here, again, that Sarah is in her 30s and that she's sharing about 95 centimorgans. So we take that number, we plug it into this chart, and we get these top relationships. 
Now, again, they're not the same age. They cannot be true third cousins. It's almost impossible, really, with the generation gap between them that they could be even. So we can cross that one off altogether. There's also some half relationships in here, which, again, are a possibility. But for the most part, unless you know of some um, marriages like a woman married two men or whatever, you can kind of cross those off. So there are a few relationship possibilities in this chart that we can look at. So if we start here and we do what I suggest, we put my grandmother on the chart of the person who was tested. This is the pedigree chart that Sarah has provided. And you can see here we've got birth years for her maternal grandparents, born right around the turn of the century. I think that's supposed to be 1899, right? I don't think she was actually born in 1999. And then there's Maria in 1912. So I'm putting my grandmother here. She was born in 1913. So I think this is the generation in her matches chart where she fits. That means to the left, we write the removes. Once removed, twice removed. So it looks like Sarah is twice removed from my grandma, just from the information that we have right here. So there's my grandma's chart. There's her mom. So People who are also descendants of her grandparents would be my grandmother's first cousins. Can Sarah be a descendant of the grandparents? No. She still lives in Italy. She's 30 years old. These people came over here. They had all their children. Dominica was their only child until they moved to the U.S., and then they had children here. So it's very, 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 very unlikely that this is the connecting ancestral couple right? It's much more likely that we're connected back here somewhere. I only have this information for Martin. I don't have any information for Grandma TV. All I know is that she was the youngest of 13 children and that her husband, Martin, came to the United States before her and she and Dominica stayed in Traversella because her favorite sibling was sick. And she waited there until her favorite sibling died, and then she came to the United States. That's the extent of knowledge that we have about this family. So I'm thinking it's either connecting here, where I don't have that much information, or here where I have zero information. So where did these relationships fit in our chart here? So we have 35% likely that we're second cousins once removed, or 30% likely that we're second cousins twice removed. So either is a possibility according to our genetics. So if we extend out Sarah's chart and we put my grandmother on it and we do my labels, which means we skip the generation right after my grandma and then we start first, second cousin. If Sarah and my grandma are second cousins twice removed, this is the generation in Sarah's chart where we'll find our common ancestor. <laughs> That's a lot of genealogy. <laughs> Why? Because Sarah's so young. So we have to look so much farther back in her chart to find our common ancestor. Now, that's if we're second cousins twice removed. If we say it's possible that we could be second cousins just once removed, then this is our connecting generation, which suddenly looks amazingly easy, <laughs> but it's still not. So just by doing that simple exercise, I can see how much work I would have to do in Sarah's chart to help me figure out a relationship. So what this means is, one of these two times great-grandparent couples could be Bert and his wife or this couple. That's what I'm looking for. I'm looking to see if one of her couples is a Franza or a TV. That's my work. And I just found this last week, guys, so I still have to. To genealogy, right? 
So, but this has given me the scope of the project and it's helped me to see what I need to do next. So Sarah then becomes my best match. She's related to the people I want to investigate. So what do we do after we find a best match? Find a new match. How do you find a new match? Shared matches tool. So I use the shared matches tool with Sarah and I find these two people. Now you can see they're not sharing very much DNA with me, which means these people are even more distantly related than Sarah, which means for me, I'm not even gonna look at them. It will be way too much work if we even find a common ancestor, which with amounts of DNA shared that are this low, I'm not even confident there is one. So right now, the way it stands, I don't have any way to network with Sarah. These are my only possible people to network and they're not helping. So it's still just me and Sarah. If these were good matches, I could figure out how these matches are related to each other and then I could figure out how I'm related to them. But they're not, so I'm left just with me and Sarah. I've reached out to her, I sent a very friendly note, encouraged her to write back even if she doesn't know anything else, and hopefully she will write back to me. But I have looked up, um, there's a lot of record matches on my heritage for her ancestors that she does have listed, and I've looked through those records, but so far I haven't found anything more than she already had posted. But again, I haven't looked as much as I need to, and I still plan to do that soon. So we have a little activity. So everybody with a card, come on up front. So they're first going to show us our predicted relationship oh, yeah, yellow. yellow one yeah, there we go okay who hired you five you hired me. okay well you're not fired yet we'll give you another chance all right so hold turn your cards around oh yes yeah. so put the yellow one in front and turn your cards around yep there we go turn 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 all right what's our predicted relationship fourth cousins Oh, yeah, hold them up, guys, so that everybody can see. Thank you. All right. These matches in my network are fourth cousins to me. That's what my heritage has told me. All right. So next, they're going to flip, and they're going to look at their red card and put themselves in order because it's a lot of organizing people, right? You're looking at different elements of your relationships, and they have to reorganize themselves. They're going to tell us how much DNA... Are they sharing with me? So once you have your red cards, hold them up high. How much? Oh, hold the red one up. I know, it's, it's tricky. Because you have to look at the back and then you have to flip it over. I know. All right, how much? What should we do with this number? Put it into the shared Morgan project. What's that going to give us? our genetic relationship from which we can calculate which generation in our matches chart holds our common ancestor. So which generation, guys, look at your orange card and rearrange yourselves. <laughs> orange card. So look at the orange, the next one. So you're number one, huh? Moving to the top. Seven. All right, now put your orange card in front. Yes, so stand right here in front of this guy. Perfect. Okay, hold it up. Oh, yeah, hold the, the orange one in front. Perfect. Yeah, great. Thank you. Good. All right, who is our common ancestor? Our great, great, great grandparents. This is the generation in their chart that holds the common ancestor for all of us. So I need to go all the way out to their great, great, greats. This is a long way. Should we see how much genealogy they have? <laughs> all right, flip to your blue card. So the blue card, now, I, because we are in Scandinavia, usually we would use surname and location, but now we're just going to use a big location, a county, and a smaller municipality to try to figure out our connection. So our county... Hold your blue card up. It's okay. Perfect. All right. 
Look at this. We've got one, two people with blank cards. Didn't post your pedigree, did you? <laughs> what are we going to do with her, guys? And this lady, no pedigree, which means we don't get information from them. But sometimes there's enough that you can figure out where, what's our county? Anybody from Norway? Yes. Oslo is in the county of Akershash. I don't know how to say it. Right? Okay. So that means that our common ancestor should be somebody in the pedigree charts from this place, right? Place means a lot, but it's a big county. Let's see if we can find a municipality that's green. Oh, <laughs> what? So she gave a very broad general location for her ancestor, but she didn't give us any specific information. Uh-oh. Oh, six. There you go. Uh-oh. Shoot. That's because I must have messed it up. Hold on. It's an A. You're here. Sorry. Thank you. Oh, no. Oh, no. Just kidding. She's already there. You're going to be here. Three. Sometimes it takes some manual maneuvering. All right. What's our county? Blockstad. Now, you might only know that because you're a good researcher. And even though there's holes, you know the area. You've got to know where you're looking. You've got to be familiar with all of the locations around where your ancestor was so you can see these patterns that this is our common location. So now I know how these people are related to each other. They're related to each other through a common ancestor, a great, great, great grandparent who lived in this location, which means my connection to them is found in this location. And that, my friends, is how you use a genetic network to find answers to your questions. Thank you, my lovely volunteers. Thank you. 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 Is that okay? You feel like you're, do you feel empowered? Can you go and use your match list to actually make discoveries? Good. And the more people that test, the easier it is to make discoveries. That's the short of it. So it is true that testing your cousins and your third cousins and your siblings, all of that is going to gather the genetic information required to find the people that can lead you to your answers. So I, I better just let you go. If you have questions, you can come up or I'll be out at my table. Thank you for coming.